Um, they tend to be smaller. They tend to not involve as much snow. They tend to move a little bit slower. So they don't tend to be as dangerous as the other kind of avalanche. <laughs> However, um, this one, does anyone recognize that spot? Emerald Highway. Nope. Ah. Close, <laughs> though. <laughs> Actually, not even close. <laughs> Emerald Bay. Uh, that's, the, that's the road coming around Emerald Bay. See this square-shaped hole here in this loose, wet avalanche? SUV. <laughs> so even though they're a little bit smaller and they move a little bit slower, they can still move a lot of snow. So you still want to pay attention to them. We'll talk a little bit more about these later in, in the program. The other kind of avalanches is our, our slab avalanches. These are more of an issue. They tend to break around the person. They involve a lot more snow. They can break above a person. They can break to the sides of a person. You can be in the middle of a slope and it shatters like a pane of glass. And they tend to move a lot faster. Highway speeds. You can imagine being swept down a mountain. There. Luckily, he did not get buried. Um, what else can be triggers? Snowmobile, sure. Pretty much anything, right? Anything that adds weight to the snowpack. Any guesses as to which one of these is the most common trigger for avalanches? What's that? No. What? Someone said snowboarders. No. Someone said explosives is actually not that high. New snow. Additional snow is actually the most common avalanche trigger. Um, yeah. It's, it's pretty impressive. The ones we care about tend to be triggered by snowboarders and skiers and um, snowmobilers, people. They tend to be triggered by people, explosives, things like that. Um, anyone know where this is? <laughs> it's closer than that. No, nope, it's over there. Um, Drifter Bowl, uh, Tahoe Donner, here. Those skis are six feet tall. That is here in Tahoe Donner. Uh, anyone ski at the Nordic Center on occasion? Anyone ski Sunrise Bowl on occasion? Yeah, does anyone know where Drifter Bowl is? Off, comes down to Hastings Cutoff? That's that. Um, so yeah, so that's some basics about avalanches. You need um, a layered snowpack on a steep slope with some sort of trigger. Pretty simple. It gets a little more complicated than that, but those are the basics. That's where we'll start. So what we do at the Avalanche Center is we try to give you a forecast as to, okay, well, where are you going to expect these things, these avalanches? Where might they occur on a given day? What might you do to trigger them? Um, what kind of avalanches might they be? But to really get that information out of the forecast, you need to know a few things before you start reading the forecast and looking at it. One, this is, this is a tool. Um, it's like I said earlier, it's not going to make the decisions for you. Um, there are a few apps in Europe that have come out that you can like have your phone around with you and be skiing along. You're like, go left, you're getting into avalanche stream with the danger's higher. Oh gosh, I gotta get out of the way. <laughs> um, I don't really subscribe to those. Uh, I think that our brains and making better decisions with our information is, is a better idea. We'll see what comes of those things. Um, but uh, to really use this thing effectively, you need to know a, a few things. Um, one is you need to know what aspect is. This is how we're going to describe where the avalanche danger is. What, anyone know what aspect is? Yes, the direction the slope faces, right? You can cheat, right? You can read the slide. <laughs> but yeah, if you're standing here looking out on a, like I'm standing on a slope, the direction that I'm facing is the aspect of that slope. Um, it's a really important thing in locating where avalanches may or may not occur. Um, certain avalanches tend to occur on different kinds of aspects. So that's one way that we describe where the avalanche danger may be on a given day. Another way to describe it is by slope angle. We also say it'll be on north aspects steeper than 32 degrees. So you need to know what slope angle is and how to, how to determine it. Anyone know how to measure slope angle? An inclinometer. Does anyone have an inclinometer? OK, anybody have a smartphone? This is a technology group, right? Who has a smartphone? Raise your hand. 
So no, not everybody has a smartphone? Okay. <laughs> you all have an inclinometer on your smartphone. Um, there's numerous apps out there that can give you this tool. It's great. Um, there's, yeah, if you want one, holler and I will, I will point some out to you. Um, but it's a great tool in determining where avalanche danger might be. If we say in the avalanche forecast, the avalanche danger is high on north aspects, steeper than 35 degrees, one way to avoid that high avalanche danger is to go to slopes less steep than 35 degrees. And you can measure it with your inclinometer. You're like, oh, I'll go to that slope instead of that one. Um, great. You go to slope to face the south. Or you could go to south facing slopes and do a ski, whatever kind of steep terrain you want to do on that day. Um, it might be a little more complicated. I can't imagine a day when it'd be high on one aspect and low on another. But, um, but yeah, so we tell people where the danger is based on aspect, based on slope angle. And then we define it in an elevation range. So we'll say near and above tree line, or above tree line, the danger is this, near tree line is this, below tree line is this. We don't use actual elevation numbers um, because our elevations are very different. Say in the Carson Range, Mount Rose area, tree line is where? Yeah, maybe. Sierra Crest, it might be closer to eight. Um, but we might see similar avalanche um, issues in terrain, in the above tree line terrain in both places. So when we say near and above tree line terrain, we mean slopes that are more exposed to the elements. They're higher elevation. They tend to get more snow. They tend to get more sun. sun. They tend to get more wind. They tend to be colder. Um, they tend to have less trees and other anchor points. Um, so what do you think about avalanches on near and above tree line terrain? Do they tend to be bigger or smaller? They tend to be bigger, yeah. Um, but are you, gonna, are you as likely to hit something when you get caught in one above tree line? No. Not as likely. You're going to get buried by a lot more snow, but you might not hit a tree. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so near and above tree line tends to be that more exposed, more open slopes. Um, you have a question? If there's like a side, like there's a cover, but there's another one right next to it? Why, yes, there it is. Um, so one great indicator of avalanche act of whether or not a slope is stable is recent avalanche activity. You're like, oh, look at that. That slope slid. That one didn't. Maybe I shouldn't ski that one today. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Um, these are just some more examples of near and above tree line terrain. And most of these photos are from here, uh, this area. So this is Carpenter Ridge, just north of Truckee. Uh, this is Ralston Peak um, down on the South Lake. Um, obviously, this terrain is much bigger. It's much more open. It's much more exposed. Um, this guy didn't actually, he skied out of this, shockingly. Um, yeah, no, the red X did not mean something worse, which is good. Uh, but it's like four friends skied over here. And like, oh, I think I'll go ski this steeper, more cliffy area because it looks fun. Um, Where is that, Andy? Ralston Peak, um, which is down by like Echo Your Summit. Echo Summit. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is near tree line terrain. Um, it's not fully open and exposed, but it's pretty open and exposed. So this is near tree line is that borderline between the above tree line and below tree line. So you can think of it instead of just an elevation band, think of it as slope characteristics, terrain characteristics. So then we start talking about below tree line terrain. You know, it's smaller, the openings are less big, they tend to have less snow, they tend to have less wind, they tend to have a lot more trees. So a small avalanche in below tree line terrain tends to still push you into a lot of trees. The trees here are big. They hurt when you hit them. Um, so below tree line terrain doesn't necessarily mean it's safer. Um, it can be just as dangerous and sometimes more so. This is below tree line terrain. This is the four foot crown into a lot of trees. Ouch. Um, actually, currently our avalanche danger is higher below tree line than it is above tree line due to our current snowpack structure. Why is that? There's a buried surface hoar layer that uh, it's, it's hoar frost that forms on the snow surface. And then if it gets buried, it's like little potato chips holding up the entire snowpack. Um, so when you step on them, they tend to break and it slides. However, in near and above tree, 
in near and above exposed tree line terrain, you tend to get more wind, more sun, more, um, more exposure to the elements. And so those small fragile crystals, well, sometimes they're not so small, they break, they go away, they, they melt, they blow over. Um, but in protected areas, they can stay standing and get buried more easily. So that's why we've got an issue going on below tree line right now. And you can, I, you can see a small slide here. Yeah, it's not that big a deal until you hit that. <laughs> so that's, that, those are the ways that we describe where the avalanche danger may be. We describe it by aspect, slope, angle, and elevation. And that gives you a pretty good handle on which, thing, which places you might want to watch out for on a given day. The other thing we do is we describe it with the avalanche danger scale. Um, this is a five-step scale that is often misunderstood. I'll start with saying the, the, once you get past low danger, so low danger, natural and human triggered avalanches are unlikely, okay, but small avalanches are still possible in isolated areas or extreme terrain, okay, all right. It's generally safe, but I'm gonna watch out for snow on, un, unstable snow on isolated terrain features. Okay, that's, so in low danger, I should still pay attention. <coughs> once I jump up to the second level, human triggered avalanches become possible, great. If I told you all tonight in, in, the, in the, the announcement for this talk, I was like, all right, well, it's gonna be a great talk. It's gonna be so fun, but it's very possible that the building's gonna collapse on us tonight. You might have all stayed home and watched the live stream, right? <laughs> um, so <laughs> you're gonna start making different decisions when human triggered avalanches become possible. Um, by the time you get into the third step of the danger scale, so we're only halfway up it, right? Human triggered avalanches are likely. If I told you that it was likely this building was going to collapse, you definitely would have stayed home. You'd be like, oh yeah, it's a great thing we got that live streaming thing going now. It's awesome. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's only step three out of our five step scale. Once you get into high and extreme, avalanches are going to happen. Um, so in this danger scale, the most common avalanche, the most common danger ratings for avalanche fatalities and incidents are actually at considerable and moderate, two and three, because that's when people are out and that's also when the snowpack's complicated. Um, when it's high and extreme, it's pretty obvious that things are sliding. So what would you consider it right now? Right now, I think it's moderate. It was moderate today. Yep. Can someone read the forecast? Yep. So that's saying human triggered avalanches are possible in certain areas. Um, so for me, when I make decisions based on that, I try to figure out one, what the average problem is, which we'll get into in a minute, and how I can manage it, if I can manage it. And then two, is it worth managing? Can I avoid it or could I try to pick a slope where I'm going to get good recreation, but maybe not have to involve as much avalanche hazard? So, so that's, our, that's our overall danger scale. So those are basically the terms you need to know to understand the forecast. There's not that many of them. You need to know aspect, slope angle, elevation, and the danger scale. There's only four. You guys are all smart. Um, I bet you can remember those four. So once you get those terms down, reading the forecast becomes a different uh, beast. First, you've got to actually go get the forecast. Um, my guess is that most of you are not using the phone line and they're getting it on the internet. Um, it's a much better way to get the forecast. You get a lot more graphical information and you can get two more information and you don't have to listen to me talk. Um, hey, I, I still appreciate the phone line. You do. For search and rescue, I'll get a call at 5 p.m. Maybe I didn't read the forecast that morning because I was working. Yep. And so I can listen to it on my way. To As you're call. getting there, yeah. So we, we still get lots of calls on it, so we maintained it. We've Great. talked about getting rid of it, but it's good to hear that people still use it. <laughs> so, so yeah, once you get there, however you get there, uh, this is what the information will start to look like. We'll have a, on the website, we'll have a home page and it's got a whole bunch of, of information on it, ranging from recent observations to the, the bottom line, which is a summary of the danger for that day. Um, and then if you want to get into the actual advisory, there's a couple of different ways to get there. And that's what it looks like. And you guys can all read that, right? <laughs> um, we'll break that down. The, the layout of the advisory, I'm going to start with the disclaimer. It's actually at the bottom of the advisory, but it's just telling you where the advisory applies and for how long it applies so that you don't try to use the avalanche advisory from December 1st for, you know, March 1st. Um, and you're not trying to use the avalanche advisory for 
Tuolumne when we wrote it for up here and haven't seen anything that's going on in Tuolumne this year. Um, the first thing you'll come to on the advisory page is our bottom line. We'll break it out by elevation and we'll discuss what's going on in very simple terms. Um, this is not the specifics, this is not the details, this is the basics. Uh, below that we get into more of the details and this is where you can start getting really good information about what kind of avalanche problems there are and that can really dictate how you travel on a given day. Because you can imagine that if we had a moderate avalanche danger day, human triggered avalanches are possible. Okay? So if I have that moderate danger rating and I say, okay, human triggered avalanches are possible on slopes deeper than 30 degrees on all aspects. You're like, huh, okay, that's interesting. But the only avalanche problem for the day is loose dry avalanche sloughs or loose dry avalanches, so sloughs, point releases. That's one version of moderate danger, right? That might be very different than if I said the avalanche danger is moderate only on northwest, north, and northeast aspects, but the avalanche problem is deep persistent slabs that are going to trigger six foot crowns if you trigger them and break above you. <laughs> Still possible to trigger an avalanche, same likelihood, but very different problems. And that's where this section can be really handy. This is starts to tell you more specifics about what to expect out there. So we get into what problem it is, where we expect it, what the likelihood is, what size we expect it to be, and how, where the danger trend is going on that. And then we'll discuss the specifics with text. Um, and those avalanche problems can be anything from loose dry and loose wet like we talked about at the beginning. They tend to be more manageable, um, easier to deal with. You start getting into wind slabs and storm slabs. These are the slab avalanches. But again, these are somewhat manageable. It's pretty easy to avoid terrain where wind slab avalanches exist. You're just like, oh, I'm not going to go to wind loaded slopes. Great, done. Um, <laughs> storm slabs tend to release under your feet and go downhill from you. They tend to be a little bit shallower because they're just involving storm snow. Of course, a storm slab in Tahoe could be a six foot crown. Um, some of our storms. <laughs> we haven't had one of those in a few years, but. We can always hope, right? Um, so these tend to be a little more complicated to manage and you tend to have to start thinking a lot more about how you travel in the backcountry. When you start getting into wet slabs and persistent slab avalanches, these are the kinds that are really hard to predict and they tend to break above you. So you're out in the middle of the slope and there's two tracks on it already and you're like, oh sweet, skiing along. And, Unbeknownst to you, there's a slightly shallower spot next to a rock and you go over that spot and trigger the entire slope. Um, so these tend to be really hard to manage um, by anything other than avoiding them. Um, wet slabs are actually pretty easy to avoid because when the recreation is good, wet slab potential is usually lower because they happen when it's wet and mushy and mashed potato-y. By that time, you wanna be like hanging out at the lake having a barbecue in the spring versus out trying to slog through wet snow. Um, persistent slabs are a different beast altogether. And then we get into things like deep persistent slabs, which are even worse um, and even harder to manage. There's pretty much no way to manage them safely. And cornices. So those are, our, those are the avalanche problems that will, just, that will pop up in that avalanche problem box. On any given day, there may be as many as three. Usually we try to keep it down to the, the top two. Once you get through the avalanche problems, we start talking about what we've been seeing. Where, what's the data that we've been using to get to this, this forecast? Um, our recent observations paragraph says, okay, here's what we've seen. This is why we think what we think. This is the data we have. Um, and then we've got links to the actual pieces of data, to the observations that we put out. Um, below that, we get into a mountain weather discussion that we create with the National Weather Service in Reno. Um, they help us out with the two-day mountain weather forecast and then we write a, a brief summary. So, and that's the avalanche forecast. It's got a lot of information for, for a um, page of the internet. I think so at least, but I'm a little biased. <laughs> so a lot of people, well I'll, I'll ask, what time do you think I get up? The avalanche forecast goes out at 7 a.m. 4.35. 4.35. 4 
Anyone think I'd go out and get data in the middle of the night? Okay. A lot, there's a lot of misconceptions about how we generate the avalanche forecast. Um, so we'll go into some of that. We don't actually get up at like 2 a.m. and go out and dig holes in the snow. A lot of people ask me this. Um, we, we do spend a lot of time digging holes in the snow, but it's usually during the day. So we'll start our day by getting up at 4.30ish, writing the avalanche forecast, it gets published by 7, and then we spend the rest of the day in the field collecting data create, to create the next day's avalanche forecast. So the data, snowpack data we're using to create the forecast comes from the day before and everything leading up to that. We're um, much better at predicting what happens to the snow overnight than we are at using a weather forecast that's already 12 hours old. Um, if we wrote the avalanche forecast when the snow data was the freshest, aka 5 o'clock in the afternoon, published at 7 o'clock in the evening, by the time anyone went out and started using it, our weather forecast would already be 12 hours old and it might be wrong by then. <laughs> so we like to use the most recent weather forecast we can and then predict the changes that happen to the snow. Um, and we tend to be better at that. So, so when do you actually write the forecast? I write the forecast starting at usually 4.50 in the morning and I'm done typing hopefully by 6.50 so I can proofread and get all the gramma grammatical errors out of it. Um, sometimes I'm done by 6.59 and there's spelling mistakes in the forecast. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So what is the new information you get from the uh, time you leave work, you know, at six or seven, and when you wake up and write the forecast? So the information I get overnight, you mean? Uh, we'll get to that. Can you hold that question for a little sure. bit? Sweet. Um, so I'm going to start with what we do to get uh, snowpack information, which is gathering all these snowpack observations. We're looking for that layered snowpack structure. What is it? Where does it exist? What, where is this weak layer? Is it widespread? Is there no weak layer? Is there a little weak layer with no slab on top of it? Is there a weak layer with a slab on top of it that's just, that can support itself right now but might not support itself with another two feet of snow? What's going on out there? How do we get this information? Anyone know what technology we use to get snowpack observations? Shovels. <laughs> um, exactly. Um, we use a lot of shovels. We dig a lot of holes in the snow. We move a lot of snow. Um, we use our eyes. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking for recent avalanche activity. Oh, great. Hey, look, this, does this slope look very dangerous to you guys? It's only about 10 feet tall. Um, so it's not actually that dangerous. Like that's as far as it can move. So it makes a great test slope, but then by that same extension, if this slope slides, something like it that's much bigger might slide as well, but I don't need to go to that big slope. I can go to the little one and test it. Um, so we spend a lot of time jumping up and down on test slopes and ski cutting test slopes and digging holes in test slopes. Um, again, using smaller slopes to try and predict what's gonna happen on larger slopes so that we don't have to put ourselves into uh, dangerous terrain, but we can still get meaningful data. It's a delicate balance. And then we take all that data and we record it somehow. Our snow pit data may look something like this. Our avalanche observations may just be lines in a database that then get displayed on a website in a nicer way um, with photos and videos and things like that. Um, we GPS everything so that we have a geo-reference database so that we can say where everything's happening. It makes it easier for us to map this information in our minds um, with the help of a computer. And then we spend a lot of time doing this, poking at the snow, trying to figure out where those layers are, what they're doing. How strong are those layers? Where are the weak layers? If I tap on them, do they break? How much do I have to tap on them? How much do I have to put on top of them to break them? Um, I do a lot of hand pits, so not full snow pits, but I'm just like, oh, I'm skiing along. Look at that. That's interesting. I better dig in the snow. So sometimes I don't even use the technology of a shovel. I just use my hands. <laughs> so we spend a lot of time trying to pay attention to what's going on around us and what's below the surface in the snowpack. Um, let's see here. Whoa, where'd that mouse go? There it is. Rather than just show you guys pictures, I'm going to see if we can get some. We try to record stuff 
in the form of photos, videos, snow pits, et cetera, so that um, it's accessible to as many people as possible. Um, you can see that small crack that happened on my ski. That's just one example of an observation that says, hey, look at that. Oh, there's my test slope sliding. Um, how many degrees is that? How steep is it? Yeah. It was like 38, um, which happens to be the perfect angle for avalanche activity. <laughs> so that makes a good test slope. Um, Steeper slopes tend to just slide before they build up dangerous events. Yes, so slopes that are <laughs> too steep to hold snow, the snow tends to slough off of them. Um, in, say, Colorado, they'll say, oh, yeah, you don't really get avalanches on slopes more than 45 degrees. Here we could push that as high as, oh, I'd say 60. Our snow sticks to things a little bit better. Um, so, yeah. Um, Here's one of the kind of tests that we do. You can see we've isolated a, a snow pit here. And this is basically we're trying to create a, a miniature version of the slope that we can hammer on. Um, and Brandon's trying to figure out, oh, look at that. Not only could he break that weak layer, but then that fracture shot across the column he built and fell out. Um, There's another test slope here. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that or not. There it goes. Yeah. So again, we're in safe spots, but we're able to collect meaningful data um, about what's going on in the snowpack. And you know, it's not. There's not a lot of great. Uh, super duper technological tools that let us do this. But the technology is in how we analyze it and how we, how we store it. Um. <coughs> Let's see, I've got one more for us here, or maybe I have two more. Um, but these again are the tests that we, we do on a regular basis. Oh, maybe we won't watch this, there we go. <laughs> So this is, I would say, a deep persistence lab. We have a persistent weak layer at the bottom of the snowpack in this case. Um, you can see that it's well over my head kneeling, so it's probably a four to five foot slab um, sitting on top of it, which is always disconcerting. Um, you know, it's one of those things that's difficult to trigger, but if you do trigger it, it's gonna be a really bad situation. Um, in this test, because you can't tap on it at the top and expect to get that force to transmit down. So what we're doing is starting a fracture in the snowpack and seeing if it will actually propagate along the weak layer. <laughs> oh, it does. Look at that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then here we have Another one of those tests on a surface ore layer, like the one we were just talking about, this is actually not from this year, but um, it's a, a similar setup. Surface ore is, is a particularly nasty, persistent weak layer. It doesn't go away very fast, and it's really fragile. Um, but it's, uh, and it's also really hard to see. So we'll see if, if uh, what happens here. But my guess is, since that I put it in the presentation, it probably fails. <laughs> so, but again, these tests give us a little microcosm of what's going on in, in the world around us. Um, so when you do one of those uh, tap type tests, yep. how, how does that translate into like a skier's weight or um, like in terms of sort of, you know. So these tests, there's a lot of research that goes into how these tests have been developed over the years, um, mostly done by there's a snow science lab in Bozeman, Montana. Um, there's a snow science lab in Calgary, Mon uh, Calgary, BC. No, Calgary's in Alberta. There we go. Um, and then there's uh, a bunch of research that gets done in Davos in Switzerland um, and some in Vancouver, BC at the university there. Um, so over the years, all these researchers have come up with 
valid snowpack tests. Um, and these two, the propagation saw test where you initiate the fracture with your saw and the extended column test, which had the column that was about this big, are two of the more recent tests that work extremely well. They're still not 100% accurate, uh, but they work better than any of the other tests out there right now. So that's, that's where they come from. And in terms of what they mean, uh, the propagation saw test, there was the, it's been calibrated to if you cut to within half of your column, so I'm sliding my saw up and I get to less than halfway up the column and it fails and slides down on top of me, then that indicates that that weak layer is likely to propagate a fracture. If you can start a fracture in that weak layer, it's likely to continue. Um, the extended column test, if you're tapping on it and it fails and the fracture propagates across it, that would be considered an unstable result. Um, if it doesn't propagate all the way across it, it would be considered, go look for more signs of instability. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, so in all this data collection, we're trying to map where these weak layers are. And you guys already know how we describe where they are, so that's how we try to map them. We're like, all right, well, is it a buried surface horror layer that only exists on near tree line, sheltered, north-facing slopes? Maybe so it's just in those, those sections of our aspects and elevations. Or maybe it's uh, wind slabs that are happening from a southwest wind. So they exist more predominantly on near and above tree line leeward aspects. From a southwest wind would be like north, northeast, and east. Sometimes southeast and northwest. Um, or maybe it's due to the fact that it's, the snowpack's warming up really fast because the sun's hitting it. And we have some weak layers that get formed by that rapid warming. So maybe they're more on the sun exposed aspects. Whatever that is, we're then gonna take, okay, we now know where these weak layers are. We know about how strong they are because we've been hammering on them. And now we've got to put on whatever happens overnight. Um, so to get the information that happens overnight, we're going to use the weather forecast. We're going to use remote sensors around the forecast area. Fortunately for us, we have a ton of ski areas, a ton of snow tail sites, which are um, remote sensors to monitor snowpack and um, water content. And we're going to look at those and say, okay, well, how much snow did we get overnight? We got two feet of 10% density snow. Great. That means that we'll probably get human triggered avalanche just to be likely because that'll just tip the balance just enough so the snowpack's unstable if you put one more thing on top of it. Or maybe we'll say, oh, look, we got six feet of new snow overnight and it was 30% density. Okay, everything slid. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're going to use all this remote data to get at what happens overnight when we're not out there. Um, and that'll be from the sensors, the snow tell stuff. And then we'll use the weather models and forecasts to actually say, okay, well, what's going to happen on top of it today? Um, does it, you know, okay, we've got, a, we've got a weak layer there. Nothing happened overnight. But the forecast says we're going to get three feet of snow today with southwest winds at 50 to 60 miles an hour. Great. Uh, let's try and put that on top of the snowpack and see what happens. So this is where we start using a wide variety of products that are available to everybody. Um, but we may use them a little differently than, than most folks. And can you talk, not necessarily, not necessarily quantitatively, but how often does what you would have written before you went to bed and what you write in the morning change? And it seems like those would be really interesting days and forecasts. And can you just talk about that a little bit? It happens all the time, um, shockingly. So, it happens enough that I've stopped trying to um, write certain sections of the forecast at night. Like, well, I'd rather wait until tomorrow morning and spend my energy thinking about it then and spend my time sleeping now. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it happens more often than you would think. The, the weather changes significantly overnight. Um, our storms, our weather patterns here tend to change really quickly. Uh, they tend to move fast. And, based on the timing of when a storm impacts the forecast area, if it's different by three hours, we're gonna get a significantly different avalanche cycle. Uh, maybe it's, okay, well, our storm system is all of a sudden slowed down and it's gonna spend an extra two hours over the forecast area, which means we get an extra six inches of snow um, in a heavy storm. So that, that can change pretty dramatically with small changes in the weather. 
Um, so yes, it happens pretty often that, it, that what I would have written if I wrote it at 7 o'clock is different than what I would write in the morning. Is there any correlation between frequency or likelihood of an avalanche and, and ambient temperature? Um, less than you might think. Um, so ambient air temperatures assume. So I'm going to rephrase your question and make sure everybody, make sure I understand and make sure everybody else understands it too. So he's wondering, does the air temperature affect the avalanche danger uh, significantly? Do we have, if we have a warming air temperature, do we get more avalanches or? And or the rate of change. So the rate of change, yes. The warmer the snowpack is, the closer it is to zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit, the faster that snow changes when it's on the ground. So the faster it can bond, the faster it can melt. The colder it is, the slower it changes, the longer it preserves um, whatever it might keep preserving. It could be a weak layer, it could be some other snowpack structure. Um, in terms of ambient temperature actually triggering avalanches, um, it's less directly correlated than you might think, and there's some really complicated science behind it, which we should talk about afterwards. <laughs> so, Andy, when the soundings, are you guys using actually acoustic devices to sense what the snowpack is? No, so soundings are actually uh, from weather balloons. They're a vertical profile of the atmosphere, which can give us really good indications of freezing level and what kind of precipitation we might get and the stability of the atmosphere. So every day, the Weather Service sends up two weather balloons from Reno and they basically map the atmosphere as they go up um, and can tell you, you know, what temperatures are where and so forth, and what's the humidity at various points in the atmosphere and so forth and so on. Um, if you look up the skew T diagram, you'll be able to see them and they're, they're pretty, they have a lot of information crammed into one diagram. Hmm. So. Um, so yeah, once we get all of our snowpack information and then we add our forecast on top of it, add what happened overnight on top of that, we then sit down and type out a forecast. And that's what you see at 7 a.m. every morning. Uh, sometimes 7.01 if I'm feeling a little slow. So, and that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight. Um, I didn't want to take up too much time because I wanted to leave some time for questions. Then I also wanted to start talking a little bit about where we're hoping to go in the future, but I figured we'd start with questions now and then go to there next. So start interrogating me. Thank you, Andy. That was wonderful. How many you, those people that are like you that are going out and cutting the snow and tapping on the snow, how many of them are, are there? Well, um, there's myself, Brandon Schwartz, one of the other forecasters, who's he's our lead forecaster. Um, Steve Reno, who's another forecaster. So there's three forecasters. We just hired Steve this year. That's a big step for us. So up until now, it was just me and Brandon. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're pretty excited to have a third forecaster on board. And then we have two paid observers. So they don't get up at four and write the forecast, but they go out and dig holes in the snow and collect data for us to send it to us. And that's um, David Reichel and Travis Feist in Southlake, who were probably your instructors. Um, and then, so the Avalanche Center then has that side of it, which is the operational side of it. The forecasters are housed in the National Forest Service under uh, the Forest Service umbrella. And then we have a, a nonprofit that's attached to the Avalanche Center that raises money and uh, gives that to the Forest Service to operate the program because the Forest Service can't afford to operate the program on its own. So it's about a half and half sort of thing. It's a great partnership. Um, yes? Um, a school teacher friend of mine was a professional patroller at Alpine for many years, and one of his jobs was to get out really early, and they have to ski every run to make sure they're uh, safe, especially after a snowfall. And his job was to set off avalanches, usually just with uh, his skis. Yep. But uh, where it was uh, stubborn, then they called in the explosives. They had a variety of hand grenades and air grenades and cannons if they needed them, but I think Alpine is one of the more avalanche prone resorts around but do you get a lot of input from the resorts because they're prime i mean it's, it's in their interest to be safe yes um, so i'm going to repeat the question so that all of you folks who are not here can hear it um, he was asking do we get a lot of input from the uh, the ski areas that are doing active avalanche control on their mountains to make sure that the ski areas are safe for people to go into 
Um, the answer is yes. We do get a lot of data from those guys. We have a very good relationship with most of the patrols in the area. Um, they use our forecasts, we use their data, um, and it's, it's great. Um, however, as you mentioned in your question, they throw a lot of explosives at the slope. There's a lot of people on all those slopes. They do a lot of ski cutting. Um, they have changed their snowpack from what you would see in the backcountry. So they're very different snowpacks just across that line. I know someone mentioned side country earlier, um, and you probably get grief for it because people are like, side country, there's no such thing. It's either backcountry or front country. Um, and that's pretty much true. Once you cross that line, um, it's an entirely different world because there is no control work done on it, um, and it is a truly backcountry snowpack. So instead of someone throwing a bunch of bombs at it and getting rid of that deep, pers deep persistent weak layer, like, oh yeah, we got six foot crowns because we threw 50 pounds of explosives on the slope. Um, great, that's not a problem for them anymore, but no one did that in the backcountry. Um, that persistent weak layer is still there and it's just waiting for the right trigger. Maybe you need, the trigger you need is that 50 pound explosive. Maybe it's just a person in the right spot on the slope. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, we share a lot of data but the, the, there are only certain times when it's really applicable to either us giving data to them for the, the ski area or them giving data to us for the, the backcountry. Usually when we're dealing with like a storm snow weakness where we got four or five feet of snow and there's a weakness within that snow that exists everywhere because they haven't touched it yet. Oh, someone over there. Yes, hit me. You might have answered my question, but can you elaborate on how the center is funded? Sure. Um, so the Avalanche Center is a public-private part. Oh, the question was, can you elaborate on how the Avalanche Center is funded? Um, and the Avalanche Center is a public-private partnership that the government and your tax dollars fund part of it. Um, and we work out of the Tahoe National Forest in the Truckee Ranger District. Um, and that's where the three forecasters work. That's where our office is, although we're not in the office very often. Um, we're mostly outside. Um, and the Forest Service provides uh, office space, a truck, um, some of the funding. And then there's a nonprofit, which Donnie is the executive director of, who they fundraise to raise the remaining funds for the, for the program. Um, and does that pretty much answer your question? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. <laughs> the question was, what are, our, what are our biggest fundraisers and how can people in this room help support? Um, you know, the fundraisers that we have are very, they're, they're, they span the gamut of fundraising. There's everything from uh, preseason parties to avalanche awareness nights to um, stuff like the skiing for schools, we do lift, the ski areas give us lift tickets, we sell them, they give us the money for them, um, so forth and so on. Um, and the easiest way to find out about it is to go on the website. On the homepage, you'll see whatever fundraisers are coming up, and there's obviously an a, a online donation that, that um, folks can make. But you know, this room tends to be a group of, of uh, or seems like this room might be a group of um, specially talented people in certain areas. And so things like software development or app development or volunteering a little time to help manage a database would be incredible, incredibly useful for us. Um, right now, one of the big projects that I'm trying to push for and I just haven't had time to do is I'd like to develop an app that works for the Avalanche Center. Um, and it's not gonna be complicated. I just want it to have the forecast and for people to be able to send us observations really quick. Just be like, oh yeah, look at that, I saw that, click. Boom, it comes to me, I get to see it. Um, and that's not hard, but it's hard when you have another full-time job and you're doing other stuff, as you guys all know. So does that answer the question, sort of? Yeah. Hit me. Your, when you guys do pits, you have a, a neat chart. It's got blue bars and lines, and is there any chance, I don't know if you have time to go through that tonight, or maybe you could do a primer on your site to explain to the layperson how to interpret that data because it looks very yep. powerful. Yep. And so I've talked to a lot of people who kind of look at that and their eyes glaze over and they don't know how to interpret that, but <laughs> I but they know it's powerful and they wish they knew how. So, I would say the best answer to that question is take an avalanche class. Um, 
But barring that, um, we should chat afterwards. So snow profile, the snow pit data can be really powerful given the experience to know how to interpret it because it's really one point in the snowpack. Um, and if you don't have the right um, experience and knowledge to extrapolate from that one point into multiple points in space, then it can be really misleading data. Um, it's like <laughs> statistics, right? What is it, like five out of four people are gonna you know, eat pizza tonight or something? Uh, there's always a way to make your statistics tell you what you want to hear. Um, and um, snow pits are the same way. I could go out and dig a snow pit on any given day and have it tell you whatever you wanted it to say. Um, so knowing where and when and, and what kind of data to get from a snow pit is really important and takes a lot of experience and skill. Um, so what we try to do when we do post a pit is explain it and say, this is the salient features of that pit. Um, so you'll see in the text, you'll see a, a pit profile, and then you'll see in the text that says, tests indicated that surface ore was reactive on numerous north facing slopes. Um, and that would be like the salient information out of that pit. Um, but we also try to be super transparent with our data. So we're gonna, we're gonna post those pits out there so that people who do have a level two avalanche um, education or level three or, or patrollers or guides or whoever, they can look at that pit and then get their own information from it. Um, that being said, uh, that is another project that I have been meaning to do, is to put a, a pit tutorial on our website, but it's lower on the priority list. Um, you can also look up the SWAG, um, Snow Weather Avalanche Guidelines, um, and that'll detail, give you more detail than you ever wanted about how to interpret or how to read those pit graphs. Um, and, or you can just grab me afterwards and I'll walk you through one. REI gives some pretty good classes on avalanche. Yeah, yeah. So, and there's, there's a lot of avalanche awareness stuff out there, but yes, I would love to put a, a quick video on the web, you know, correlating, okay, here's how we're doing this in the pit. This is what it looks like in the diagram. Um, but I haven't had time. Maybe there's some, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if, in the future, or maybe currently, you offer classes in avalanche safety, or you t intend to offer classes to the community, like even group classes, day or weekend, or any sort of classes yes. <laughs> at all? <laughs> so the question is, I want to take an avalanche class. Yes. Do you offer them? <laughs> <laughs> um, we do avalanche awareness, so uh, we, you know, two to three hour presentations, one hour presentations, things like that, things like this, um, that we'll go out in the community and, and raise awareness with. Um, in terms of actual level one avalanche classes, um, it's a 24 hour course, so it's usually taught over three days. There are, I think at last count, 12 or 15 avalanche education providers in, in our forecast area. And that's everything from the community college in South Lake to Alpine Skills International Guide Service to Tahoe Mountain School to um, Alpine Glow Expeditions to NASIC, I think, teaches them. Um, yeah, there's so many avalanche education providers that we, we don't want to compete with those guys. We want to focus on the forecast and, and getting the awareness out there. And then those guys are really good at, at teaching classes. Uh, but if you want to get a class from those guys, uh, go pop on our website. There's an education tab. Um, whoa, come back here. Your mouse. There you are. So there is a list of all the local avalanche education providers. Um, and there are a lot of them. Uh, and they all offer great courses. Um, they're all, uh, most of these guys are certified by um, ARI, which is a, or the AAA, the American Avalanche Association, or ARI is the Avalanche uh, Institute and Awareness Research and Education, um, is I think what that one stands for. But they all offer great courses and um, there's a lot of them available, so. Yes? Uh, 
That's a great leading question. This is one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight. Um, one of the things that we've been really trying to push hard um, when I started, when I re, one of the things that I've done in rebuilding the website a few times is try to make public observations really easy to submit so that instead of just having five of us out there collecting data, it's everybody. Um, and you can all share data with us. Um, however, Lots of people don't like to sit down and put that stuff into their computer at night. Um, so one of my pushes would be to try to get an easier way for people to give us data, which for me is smartphone land. But again, I haven't had time to build that app. Um, yes, that's where you guys can come in if you're interested in helping. Um, and uh, so yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out ways to encourage people to do that. Um, I've started a new program with the guide services and education providers where I can, um, where they are, they're gonna get a link to their company when they submit an OB, so the OB will be attributed to them, so hopefully it spurs a little competition amongst the guide services to send us data. Um, we'll see, and then we have a lot of, a lot of public that, um, that do send us data, it's just not as much as we would like. If you're out backcountry skiing, a really easy way to help the Avalanche Center is to come in at the end of the day and send us an ob. <laughs> that's, uh, that's also pretty easy to do. On your computer. Just a quick note on the schools. Tall Mountain Sports down by Rite Aid is partnered up with Tall Mountain School, which is Stacy Kirito and Jeremy Forecaster. So. Yep. Yes. I actually have a piggyback question in a second, but the, when we're out in the backcountry, do you want, would you want information and data from us that's just our own pits once we've dug sure. them, even if there's no, nothing? Sure. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then a second, my original question is actually, in times when, uh, like since the last, I think it was the January 5th horror layer, when that builds up, it seems like that's been very localized. When you're determining the overall danger level of uh, of a slide, of a potential slide, is that in the most dangerous areas? Yes, so the, the overall, our forecast is a regional product. Um, it's, well, let me, let me back up. Uh, your first question was, so if we're out, do you want data, if, even if it's not showing us any instability, or um, you know, maybe it's not that interesting to you? Yes, we'll take whatever you send us. Um, if we get, uh, a bunch of information that says, hey, I was on Incline Lake Peak today and I saw you know, six inches of new snow and no signs of instability. That's a great piece of data. Um, or if you are, you know, maybe it's, oh, I was on Wildflower Ridge today and um, ski cut on a test slope produced a two foot slab. That's great data too. But both of those are equally valuable um, in our eyes. You know, in terms of making the decision whether or not to ski a slope, I'd say the recent avalanche activity is a really, really, really good piece of data. Um, but for us, getting any data is better than getting none da no data. And if it's totally off base and you're like, oh yeah, we hucked this huge cliff today and it was gnar and dude, it was rad, we probably aren't gonna publish that one. Uh, <laughs> but it'd still be nice to get. Uh, <laughs> So, um, and then your second question, which I was going to go into more detail, uh, but you're going to have to repeat the question for me. Uh, when weather patterns or snow patterns are more localized, oh, yeah. are you determining Yeah. So the second question is, you know, is our, our danger rating is a, is a regional product. Our avalanche forecast is focused on a region from Yuba Pass, which is up near Sierraville, down to Bear Valley, Ebbets Pass, which is a long way um, and so conditions change over that that range um, so on any given slope the regional avalanche forecast forecasted regional avalanche danger um, might be different for like one specific slope um, so yes it's basically a, it's an average product um, but what we try to do with the so with the danger rating um, if you're looking at the bottom line and just get the one danger rating icon, it is us thinking of the most dangerous spots in the forecast area. Um, if you're looking at the avalanche problems and using those, I think that's a more powerful tool 
um, because it's saying, okay, well, we've got wind slabs on north through northeast through east aspects and near and above tree line terrain. And the most heavily wind loaded areas, they may be four feet deep. In most other areas, they're going to be more like two to three feet deep. Um, and they're going to be human triggerable. So that's going to be, I think, much more useful information in making a decision than the regional danger rating, which might be moderate. Um, so does that sort of start to answer your question? Yeah. <coughs> One more question there. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about the new uh, Avatech uh, electronic uh, snow meters and the uh, Avatech uh, app that, that's out? Yes, so there, Avatech is a company that builds, um, well, they started by building a, an electronic probe that basically measures the hardness of the snowpack as it as you stick it through the snowpack. So it comes up with a, a layer profile. Um, it's a great concept. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been able to use it yet. So I don't know how, um, how effective it is or not. Uh, they're fairly expensive. Um, and yeah, there, there's mixed reviews about it. Um, but basically the goal of it is to be able to determine whether or not a weak layer exists um, with, a, with probing in the snow. You can also do that with a, with a manual probe by your hand and feeling that what the difference is. The Avatec probe's goal is to be able to quantify that data in a more um, scientific manner. Uh, it hasn't quite gotten there to the, it hasn't reached its full potential yet as far as I know, but um, like I say, it'd be fun to try one and see. Um, and then the other thing that they've done that I think is even more exciting is they've built a, um, are you familiar with the traffic app Waze? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they built a crowdsourced uh, snow and avalanche data collection app. Um, and it's only available for an iPhone right now, um, but you can do it through the web interface um, as well. But it allows you to be out in the field and say, oh, I'm going to do a snow pit test and stick that in. And then it's, it's visible to the, the folks who are subscribed to that service. Um, and uh, so it, it's, there's, there's interesting things about it in terms of you're getting point specific data from that app um, and you're not, not really getting the overview. So the variability in snowpack from this spot to this spot can be really big. Um, and so relying on point specific data is, you need a bigger picture than- Would that be an app that would be good to <coughs> programmers to get familiar with as they're building your app? Yeah, I would, and then they also have an API that I'm trying to build, a, um, that they're willing to feed me data so that I'll take their data from their app and push it into our website so that it's available to people who are not uh, subscribed to the, the Avnet as well. Um, but I haven't had time to do that either yet. It's been busy. Okay, so. hey, one, one important question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't blow, Kurt. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm nervous now. <clears throat> well, I just thought I'd mention because you, you said that somebody is normally here. Jonathan Sass has a website called magnify.com and it has great local information. It's got traffic cameras, uh, web cameras, he's got weather, snow conditions, but it's a great local resource. So magnify.com and our friend Jonathan, who missed tonight. So. Yeah. Uh, depends on how you want to get it, but yes, in some ways. If there are folks who are wanting to get that data, um, I haven't had been able to build a, I haven't had the time nor inclination to build a robust API that's feeding stuff out because just no one's been that interested in it. There's a, um, a developer from the Bay contact me and wanted to build us one. I was like, that sounds great. <laughs> um, but um, but there's some I do a lot of XML feeds and because that's what the weather service wants, um, and they're they're actually a, a pretty big partner. So, um, but I don't have like a JSON feed or anything like that. Yeah. Email subscription. We do that already. Yep. Yeah. So you can do email subscription. I do RSS feeds. I do um, pushes to Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. Um, well. I, don't push to Instagram. I don't forget all the way to do that yet. <laughs> but uh, um, 
and then uh, and then we do a couple of XML feeds, mostly for the weather service, but then some other people use them as well. So be before we stop, so as as we saw, uh, the presentation triggered an avalanche of questions, and uh, that that's a that's a very 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 good sign. Uh, and there's even more. So first of all, I want to ask uh, Garrett, is there anybody from our online viewership, not this time. Okay, so last time we, we, we had also a bunch of questions, but I, I didn't want to cut them short. Um, it, it also triggered another question uh, that I have, and I have the luxury of having the mic at, at the end. <laughs> so um, it, it sounds to me where this is heading in terms of the technology part, if we had a lot of sensors out there, like it could be Avatar type of sensors that have density, temperatures, and, and so on, and snow consistency. We have tons of weather data. There's a terabyte of weather data out there. Um, if we combine that with the social app that we talked, like tons and tons mm -hmm. of social data, put that all together, have a big data machine learning approach, and see if out of aggregating all the data, there's a way of uh, getting to something that matches or is close or at some point in the far, far future even better than manual forecast. Yeah. Is this the direction where we, we're probably going to go? Yeah. Uh, then, and then we'll, <laughs> sorry, uh, no, uh, so the, you, you, you'll have a job long enough to, to confirm that this thing is working. So I, I'm <laughs> sure, I'm sure this. So uh, there are actually a few um, avalanche, uh, there are models out there mm -hmm. that try to predict avalanche danger. Um, uh, like weather weather forecasting models do. However, um, they are not very good yet. Um, so Colorado's running, there's one called Snowpack, very originally named, um, that Colorado's running and trying to ground truth a little bit. Um, and then a bunch of the Japanese avalanche services have tried to run a few different models. And it's still really difficult for a, for a computer to take those large scale patterns and distill them into something meaningful for a, for a regional forecast, um, it, they tend to get hung up on the, the intricacies. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. OK. So you will keep your job. Thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, fascinating. So I think this is uh, uh, great. Thank you. Snow and technology, I think this is uh, Silicon Mountain at its best. So thanks, thanks again. For